transmissions from Hawaii. Randy Patey has an interesting claim to fame. He's the owner of the only commercial macadamia nut farm on Oahu. Um, I'm the owner of North Shore Macadamia Nut Company in Haleiwa. And uh, I've been growing macadamia nuts here for 50 years. Since 1971, Randy has been the owner of Kamananui Orchard, a 24-acre macadamia nut orchard with over 1,700 trees. It's located in the old sugar town of Waialua in the foothills of Oahu's tallest peak, Mount Ka'ala. And as you might expect, being a macadamia nut farmer comes with its own challenges. You know, my father said, if you're not an optimist, you should not be a farmer. (laughs) So we, you know, like anybody, we pray for rain sometimes, Uh (laughs) do a little dance here and there. But, you know, it's mainly getting the macadamia nuts off, off the ground, especially when it is raining. You don't want them to sit too long. Uh, on the ground because they are just seeds and they will germinate eventually. Uh-huh. So you want to get them off, off, off the ground as soon as possible and husk them right away. Get the husk off of them right. so that they don't develop off flavors as they start to change. Because once they start going into sprout mode, the, the kernel gets really bitter. It's uh-huh. no good anymore. Huh. And we and we contend with wild pigs that come down from the hills. Oh, really? And are very very aware of the macadamia nuts. And, 300 pounds per square inch, and these pigs pop them like nothing, you know. Really? Huh. And they, it's been passed down from generations to generations, this, this way of cracking them. So, <laughs> you know, you know, you got to get them up before the pigs get them and before the rain gets them. And so <laughs> it's a bit of a hustle. Right? But despite whatever frustration Randy may feel from time to time from having to deal with things like macadamia nut popping wild pigs, at the end of the day, it seems that Randy just loves what he does. Well, aside from just being, uh, being one of the most beautiful places on the island and secluded and away from everything, I like the part where we're pouring the husk macadamia that's into the cracker or into the, the drying bins after it's all said and done. You know, I just, and enjoying, oh, the flowering season is amazing. The, the, the smell of the, the blossoms are incredible. The, their, their blossoms are similar to the protea some protea varieties, but they smell so sweet. And just watching the nuts develop on the trees. And, you know, February, March, we don't want too much wind because, uh, you know, we don't want the blossoms to blow off. So just waiting for the nuts and watching them grow. Is, and just being able it's just, it's a, it's just a great lifestyle. It's more more a lifestyle than making a million dollars. So you have to embrace, embrace it, but it's, it's really, we're quite blessed. I'm Tony Vega, and on this episode of Transmissions from Hawaii, we are cracking open the history of the macadamia nut. As you probably already know, the macadamia nut is one of Hawaii's signature crops, and pretty much anybody that visits the islands ends up taking home with them at least a box of chocolate-covered macadamia nuts, if not cookies or something else with macadamia nuts in it. But aside from just being a delicious snack, the macadamia nut actually provides us with a really interesting window into Hawaii's history and connections with the outside world. For example, did you know that the macadamia nut is not actually from Hawaii? It's originally from Australia. And today we're going all the way from Hawaii to Australia and learning all about what is actually technically a seed. (laughs) But the macadamia nut is, is, you know, we just all call it a nut. So we're just going to call it a nut. But keep in mind, it's actually a seed. All right. So anyway, let's get started. Let's begin on Hawaii Island, a.k.a. the Big Island. So that is where the vast majority of Hawaii's macadamia nuts are produced. And Glenn Sacco grew up on Hawaii Island. So it shouldn't be all that surprising that he developed an affinity for the macadamia nut at a pretty young age. You know, as a kid, we would get them and we'd crack them and eat them. And we enjoyed it. Yeah. But um, later on, when we, when we discovered uh, roasted nuts... Um, that was, it was much, it's much easier because it's already been cracked. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that hard shell takes 300 pounds of pressure per square inch to crack it open. And so you'd have to get a hammer and, and hit it the right way on that <laughs> micro piles to uh-huh. minimize just a, a mash of, uh, of a smash nut. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so drying and 
drying it first so that it pulls back from the shell and then just being able to crack it with a, and recover a whole kernel. That was quite an art back in, <laughs> back in those days. As far as I know these days, Glenn isn't smashing macadamia nuts in his backyard anymore. Instead, he works as an economic development specialist for the County of Hawaii's Research and Development Department. As part of his job, Glenn keeps an eye on Hawaii's agricultural industry, including, of course, Hawaii's multi-million dollar a year macadamia nut industry. Glenn explains that usually Hawaii produces upwards of 40 million pounds a year of macadamias. And for example, in the 2019 to 2020 crop year, that came out to about $49 million worth of macadamias. But how is it that this industry came to be? Well, we began by talking a little bit about that history. This uh, started way back in 1937, 1936. There was the Hawaii Agricultural Experiment Stations. Mm -hmm. And they were uh, tasked with uh, developing the varieties that could bring this uh, industry, uh, make it a commercial industry. Mm. Um, We had... uh, And I'm sorry, I have to look at my notes on this. That's all right. (laughs) Uh, So there was this uh, three gentlemen, uh, Winston Jones, uh, John Beaumont, who's an established name here. Um, Well, what they initially did was they developed the grafting to propagate macadamia nut trees. Uh Um, The thing that has to be understood is that if you take the seed from a macadamia nut tree and germinate it and grow it out, that the the seed does not, uh, is not true to the parent, it'll revert to its what we call the wild type, which would then have a lot of spines on the leaves and would may, maybe have a different kind of configuration and, in, and different kind of characteristics, which is not desirable. So they developed the uh, grafting to allow for the uh, propagation of the uh, parent plant. Now, in 1936, um, they started a variety selection program with, uh, again, John Bowman, Ralph Mozau and William Story, and they were with the Hawaii Agricultural Experiment Station. Mm -hmm. So out of roughly 20,000 trees that they looked at, there were five named varieties that came out of that. And Mm -hmm. today, there's still two of them that are are available commercially. One is called the Keaho, which has the number 246, Mm -hmm. and Kaikea, which has the number 508. Mm. And so they are still used today. And that's, that's very impressive after all this time. So they, you know, they uh, continue to work and develop these, uh, uh, I'm going to say, varieties and made sure that they were able to grow and uh, produce a good yield here mm. in our climate. And um, some of the things that they looked for as they're developing these uh, or looking at these uh, varieties Number one, it had to have high yield because uh, otherwise they wouldn't be able to produce a, a profitable crop. Uh, they wanted vigorous growth because they wanted to plant the tree to get up to a good size mm-hmm. quickly. It had to have strong branches to support uh, the, I guess, the, the nuts. Um, they wanted a good shape of the, uh, of the tree because they wanted to... Um, they didn't want something that was sprawling all over the place. They wanted right. something a little more compact so they could have a tighter spacing and put more trees per acre. Um, nuts, the nuts had to be you know, roughly uniform in size and shape. Uh, they're looking for disease resistance and also for resistance to insects. Good kernel recovery. Um, high oil content. That was one mm-hmm. of the uh, key things, uh, it had to have at least 72% oil in the kernel. Um, that that adds to the good flavor. Right. And, um, you know, when they, crack, when they crack the nuts, because there's a very hard shell, you know, they wanted to get as high of a whole nut recovery as possible because that is what the uh, chocolate industry and the, whole, um, and the nut industry wants for their consumers. Now, in case you're wondering what grafting is, well, it's a way of connecting two or more plants together so that they can grow as one. 
As Glenn explained, you want to graft in order to get the desired variety of macadamia so that you can produce more and it's easier to harvest and it just has all of those desirable characteristics that growers are looking for. If you just plant the seed, which we generally refer to as the nut, then you end up getting an undesirable variety of macadamia. So, of course, there is much more to it than just that, but a very simple way of looking at it is that grafting is a way to clone the desired variety. In any case, what happened after that research was conducted in the 1930s? Back in 1946, mm -hmm. Castle and Cook, which was one of the big five uh, plantations in Hawaii, uh, and they were known for the Dole Pineapple Company, they started the, the first orchard in Keao which is just outside of Hilo. And it was under the Royal Hawaiian uh, Macadamia Nut Orchard brand. There was a, uh, I guess, a superintendent, Harry Clements, and he pushed for the uh, commercialization of macadamia nuts. Um, soon after that, um, Seabroin Company, another of the big five, uh, it began to invest in uh, macadamia nut orchards and bought this Keao orchard from Castle and Cook. And, you know, then they, um, and they eventually started marketing the well-known Mauna Loa brand, which has that distinctive trademark uh, blue can. And uh, the, one of their best marketing things that they did was uh, handing out those small Tetra packs to the, uh, airline passengers that are coming into Hawaii. Right, yeah. And they got their first taste of the macadamia nut there and would go to the stores to, to look for it. So that was, that was roughly how, it, you know, it got started. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the merchandising and promotion was just took off after that. Hawaii's macadamia industry has come a long way since the 1930s, but that's not to say that it hasn't faced any challenges. The past few decades has seen increased competition from places like China and Australia. But like so many other industries in Hawaii and around the world, perhaps the biggest challenge that Hawaii's macadamia industry is facing is the COVID-19 pandemic and its lingering effects. You know, there was a agricultural meeting in which one uh, person who had information about it said, you know, a particular processor could not move, you know, 20 million pounds of nuts. Um, because there is, you know, no market. And we've also had, you know, even uh, discussions with uh, producers who are intimately uh, connected to a processor in which the processor, again, can't buy the nuts, or doesn't want to buy the nuts. Now, what happens then is for the producer, you cannot leave the nuts on the ground for the next year because the, the quality goes bad. And then you also increase the uh, amount of disease or pests that's going to affect your next year's crop and even, you know, other generations. So the producers are really in a bind of whether to spend the money to collect the um, nuts and then they don't know what to do with it. So, so it is, it is a, a difficult situation and, you know, we'll probably this, uh, COVID-19 will probably have a negative economic impact for the next maybe three to four years. Because as the industry, once we get out of the uh, pandemic, the industry then has to recover. And it also has to, I'm sure they've cut back on fertilizer and other orchard work in the meantime, because they had to save money. So all of that then has to be, you know, slowly, um, the orchard has to slowly be brought back up to speed. And, um, you know, they might have lost some workers also in the meantime. So, yeah, th there's going to be a, a negative impact for, for a bit. If you would like to learn even more about the development of the macadamia nut industry in Hawaii, a great place to start is an article titled Macadamia Nuts in Hawaii, History and Production. It's by Gordon T. Shigeura and Hiroshi Oka. You can find a link in the show notes at transmissionsfromhawaii.com or in your podcast app. 
Next up, we'll be exploring when exactly the macadamia arrived in Hawaii and its origins in Australia. Transmissions from Hawaii is supported in part by Hawaii Ship. Hawaii Ship is a federally funded volunteer based program administered by the Hawaii Department of Health Executive Office on Aging. Their Medicare certified counselors provide free, unbiased local counseling to beneficiaries, their loved ones, caregivers, and soon to be retirees. They also offer free virtual presentations on Medicare related topics. For more information about requesting these free services or joining their team of volunteers, visit their website at hawaiiship.org. That's hawaiiship.org. You can also find a link in our show notes. As mentioned earlier in the show, the macadamia is not actually from Hawaii. It's indigenous to Australia and was brought over to the islands in the late 19th century. Historical records show that the first introduction of the macadamia to Hawaii took place between 1881 and 1885. The individual said to be responsible for this introduction is a Scotsman by the name of William Herbert Purvis, who at the time was in his early 20s and co managed a sugar plant on Hawaii Island. Just a few years later, though, there was a second introduction, and that was on Oahu in the New Lanu Valley. This introduction is credited to brothers Edward Walter and Robert Alfred Jordan. Of course, as we learned early in the show, it would still be a few more decades before the macadamia industry in Hawaii really got going. However, as I was looking into this part of the story, I came across an article on the Smithsonian Magazine website with a very eye-catching headline. The headline read, Most of the world's macadamias may have originated from a single Australian tree. Thoroughly intrigued, I read the article and came across the work of this Australian plant scientist. Um, I'm, I'm Kathy Nock. I'm a research fellow at Southern Cross University, which is located in northern New South Wales of Australia. Dr. Kathy Nock is the lead author of the 2019 academic paper that the Smithsonian Magazine article mentioned just now was based on. So, wishing to find out more about the origins of the macadamia nut, I got in touch with her. So, um, historical records show that the first macadamia, presumably a seed, was taken mm -hmm. to Hawaii in the late 1800s by somebody called W.H. Purvis. And, those, and trees were um, planted first on the Big Island, and um, a few years later, a guy called uh, R.A. Jordan took more seed to Hawaii and this was planted in Honolulu. And even though macadamia is an Australian native, we have a lot to thank Hawaii for um, because it was there that the first um, commercial orchards were planted and that um, reliable grafting techniques were developed in the mid-1930s. And this allowed for the best trees to be grafted um, in fact, the, be the grafted varieties that were first bred in Hawaii still represent most of the trees that are grown in orchards around the world today. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, that that I mean, the findings of of your research like really, you know, point back to you know, yeah, we have all these macadamias around the world, but it all you know goes back to especially perhaps a single tree, and and I will get to that. But could you explain like? What your research kind of set out to do, what was the, the goal of the research? So the research that, um, that I did with Dr. Craig Hardner from the University of Queensland and his team um, aimed to try to um, understand where the seed that was taken to Hawaii came from in Australia because, um, because there wasn't much information available on that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And so then, um, and I was reading in the paper, right, you, you used like many, many samples from different parts in Hawaii, but I believe also in, in Australia. And you, I, I guess you sequenced the genome and tried to figure out where it all uh, came from. Is that fairly accurate? <laughs> yeah, that's right. So um, Dr. Craig Hardner, who's a who's colleague mm -hmm. of mine from the University of Queensland, he, um, he mm -hmm. got a um, Churchill Fellowship um, a few years back and came to Hawaii and he spent six months there oh, and, okay. and he collected samples from uh, much of the germplasm that's, um, that's still in Hawaii today and, uh, and he brought leaf samples back to Australia. Um, 
And then, and then we got a, a student. There was a student involved and a team involved on the project, and um, uh, we then collected leaf samples from um, wild macadamia trees from across their distribution, and we sequenced the data. And so, um, I, a few years back, I'd already um, sequenced the chloroplast genome of macadamia. So this is. Um, this is maternally inherited part of the genome, much like the mitochondrial genome of humans. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, o- it's only passed through the female line. So we knew that it would be a good way to mm-hmm. trace um, that maternal lineage, so to try to understand where the seed had come from. Mm. So um, uh, in Australia, uh, back in the 80s, um, a, a fairly large effort was undertaken to survey the wild populations and mm-hmm. um and then cuttings were taken from those trees and they were planted in, in ex situ plantings in Australia that's known as the National Macadamia Germplasm Collection. And that was the source of most of the wild trees um, that oh. we included in the study. Okay. Yeah. So once, once we had all these, uh, all the DNA from, from all the Hawaiian samples and the, um, and the wild trees in Australia, we, um, we sequenced them and we mapped all of that data back to the chloroplast genome and mm-hmm. um, and we use that to try to find the origins of the um, of the seed that came from Hawaii and uh, it, it was actually we were actually able to do it we, we pinpointed the particular populations that where the uh, Hawaiian varieties had come from um, it, it was interesting because um, all but but two of the samples that Craig collected in Hawaii shared exactly the same maternal genotype. So they um, they were very closely related, and they were also really closely related to this one site near Gympie in um, in southeast Queensland. So we now think that 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 pocket that site was the source of the seed um, that was taken to Hawaii. Now, it should be pointed out here, though, that Dr. Knox says that her research does not trace the origins of these samples that were taken in Hawaii to a specific introduction. So we don't know if these samples trace their origin back to the first introduction on Hawaii Island by William H. Purvis or the subsequent one that took place a few years later on Oahu. We aren't sure whether it was um, the Purvis introduction or the Jordan introduction that... um, that was was ended up being the ones that were used um, to develop the Hawaii the varieties in Hawaii, but we do know that one of them must have collected seed um, from uh, around Gympie and in, in another site a little bit further north at this place called Mount Bopple. Those two areas are the likely source. Hmm. Um. I. I first learned about your research through the Smithsonian article, and the headline is all of the, was it, I think most of the world's macadamias can be traced back to a single tree. Would you say that's accurate, or is that too much of an oversimplification? I think that's possible. So we still haven't found that tree, but given that given that most of the Hawaiian cultivars share exactly the same uh, chloroplast genotype, it's possible that um, Purvis or Jordan collected seed from a single tree and and that was what was taken to Hawaii. So it's possible, but the jury's still out on that one. We still need to do some more work. Gotcha. So that, that actually brings me to the next thing that I wanted to ask you about, that because there is such a, I guess, uh, small or narrow genetic diversity in so much of the world's uh, cultivated macadamias, is that uh, like dangerous or concerning in some way? Does that make them more uh, susceptible to disease or pests or something like that? Uh, it may do. Um, I, I think that, that I think that more work work is needed on that. But this this isn't a problem that's unique to macadamia. Um, most of the horticultural tree crops that are grown around the world are clones. So even you can look at an orchard, and there may be uh, a thousand trees in the orchard, but but there re- there might only be three or four different individuals there, oh, and, okay. and they're clones. So that's why uh, finding new varieties. Um, and, and bringing in new genetics that's available in the wild is probably going to be important 
um, in future as the climate changes and different there's different stresses on the on the trees, whether it be um, water supply or new pests. Um, so it's important and it's recognised that it's important to conserve the wild relatives of our food crops um, to safeguard um, them in future. If you'd like to read Dr. Knox's 2019 article or the Smithsonian Magazine article that led me to her work, you can find the links in the show notes in your podcast app, or you can go to transmissionsfromhawaii.com and look for the show notes for episode three. Do, do you enjoy eating macadamia nuts? <laughs> I love to eat macadamias and, and, and to cook with them. And I think oh, really? they deserve, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I think they deserve their reputation as the world's finest nut. <laughs> what, what kind of uh, things do you enjoy cooking with macadamia nuts? Uh, well, I make pesto, so oh, um, really? oh, I, yeah, use, yeah, yeah. I use yeah. coriander or basil with um, with ground up macadamias and a little bit of oil, a little bit of parmesan yeah. cheese. Put it on some pasta. That's oh, that probably my good. that's probably my favourite way to cook with macadamias, and of course with um, desserts and cakes. So far, we've gone over the history of the macadamia in Hawaii and its introduction to Hawaii. But what about the history of the macadamia in Australia? There is so much more to discuss. For example, where did the macadamia even get its name? Well, in order to learn more about that, I ended up having a conversation with an absolutely delightful gentleman from Australia who also happens to be one of the world's leading authorities on the history of the macadamia. Uh, my name is Ian McConaughey. I guess I'm the macadamia industry dinosaur. I've been uh, I've been around for oh, probably fifty years with macadamias. <laughs> That's I like that introduction. <laughs> uh, so okay, so let's just start with you then. So how did you get involved with the whole macadamia thing? Well, I grew up in in Brisbane in uh, in Queensland, where it was almost mandatory to have a a macadamia uh, tree and uh, a mango tree in your backyard. And uh, my uh, my auntie, who was a, a wonderful mentor to me, she she had four macadamia trees, and uh, uh, she used to collect the nuts, and we used to dry them and and crack them uh, uh, with a hammer and roast them in butter, and uh, she, well, this is when I was 10 years old, and uh, she, she told me to remember them because one day macadamias would be famous. So <laughs> uh, then, then I worked for a, for a large food manufacturing company who processed peanuts and cashews and, uh, and almonds, and uh, I convinced them that uh, macadamias were, were going to become a, a viable uh, retail nut and uh, so they they uh, allowed me to go to Hawaii to uh, to study the industry there and to to build a a macadamia processing factory in 1975. Wow, huh. that's that's so fascinating because you know when when you talk to people here on on for example Hawaii Island, the Big Island, you know often you hear oh yeah yeah I had trees in my backyard we used to just you know have some for ourselves you know yeah. so I I guess that that happens over there as well huh <laughs> yes there was about thirty thousand backyard macadamia trees just in Brisbane and uh, oh. uh, we're we're actually now uh, looking for a very old. Uh, uh, backyard macadamia trees to study their DNA because they they may reflect wild macadamia trees that have been lost. Oh, wow. Oh, very interesting. Uh, but, all right, so let's talk about the macadamia uh, and uh, its origins in Australia. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, how long the macadamia has been around and its background there? Good, be happy uh, uh, to... Uh, uh, macadamias uh, evolved uh, uh, initially about uh, 115 million years ago uh, uh, with the first uh, flowering plants, the angiosperms, and uh, but it, it was uh, in the uh, uh, about 60 to 65 million years ago that they have uh, uh, aged fossilized pollen. Uh, that, now that was is macadamia like pollen not necessarily macadamias, but uh, there's no doubt that the macadamia uh, as we know it today existed about 20 million years uh, ago in the rainforest. 
It was a, it was a, a, originally widespread up the east coast of uh, of Australia. It uh, almost certainly grew in uh, in New Zealand, but uh, there there were massive climatic changes uh, uh, over that uh, period. There was volcanic eruptions. There were uh, uh, numerous ice ages. There were uh, uh, one in a thousand year uh, floods. Sea levels uh, rose. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, the the last ice age was about uh, uh, ten thousand years ago, where where temperatures mm-hmm. fell about eight degrees centigrade or Celsius, and uh, so the macadamias re- retreated in the rainforest and uh, uh, almost became extinct. They they only existed in in little niches that were were favourable uh, to them. So uh, it uh, yes, we're, we're we're lucky that uh, we're able to enjoy the macadamias because they came very close to to being lost. Well, th- yeah, I didn't know that. That's very interesting, huh? So it it basically got wiped out of New Zealand. Is that- yes, it got wiped out in New Zealand. There there are related species to the macadamia uh, in New Zealand, but uh, uh, yes, no 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 absolute evidence that. Uh, uh, they existed there, although uh, mm-hmm. uh, they found fossilized leaves that are mm-hmm. very like macadamias in uh, in New Zealand. Because of the macadamia's European sounding name, many people might assume that it was first discovered by Europeans. However, that's not true. It wasn't until the 18th century when the British began arriving in Australia in order to colonize it. By that point, though, Australia's indigenous population had already been in Australia for tens of thousands of years, and many of them were fully aware of the macadamia. The Aboriginal people, uh, they arrived in what I call macadamia country uh, at least uh, 2,000, uh, sorry, 20,000 uh, years uh, ago. Uh, there's no doubt they would have found the, the macadamia in the rainforest. But within the rainforest, they very seldom produce nuts. Uh, the, uh, uh, within the rainforest, the, uh, the, the trees didn't dominate, so they didn't receive, normally didn't receive light. Uh, they, uh, they had to compete with all the other rainforest uh, trees for uh, uh, not only light, but for moisture and, uh, and nutrients. The, uh, the, the na- native rats uh, and other animals ate the nuts. The uh, native insects uh, uh, attack the flowers and the, the uh, maturing uh, nuts, so uh, they they were very rare to uh, to the Aboriginal people. But th- there's no doubt they were very treasured. As mm-hmm. soon as soon as soon as the the European settlers uh, arrived, uh, uh, macadamia nuts were one of the, the the very first items that the Aboriginal people brought uh, into trade. And uh, they traded them for uh, uh, rum and tobacco. Uh, they also traded them for axes. And uh, there, there, there is a, a lot of a lot of information and photographs of an Aboriginal uh, uh, man called Bill and Billen, and he was the leader of his uh, group. And uh, he he organised his people to collect macadamias to bring them into the settlers and. Uh, uh, he mainly exchanged them for axes, and he used the axes to to, to cut roofing shingles to cut the the bark off uh, mainly eucalypt uh, trees, so that uh, that 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 formed the roof of the uh, of the early huts or shelters that the for the European settlers. And for the record, Indigenous Australians were consuming macadamias long before we figured out that we could dip them in chocolate and sell them to tourists. There are reports that, that, that they cultivated the macadamias by by pushing nuts into the uh, into the ground, but uh, yeah. the the Aboriginal people were essentially hunter gatherers, and uh, so the, 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 there is no evidence that they they cultivated macadamias. What what they did do, they used fire extensively. So at the ed- at the edge of the rainforest, any macadamias that were exposed. They were very aware of, so those trees got more light, and uh, main, main, mainly mainly the women uh, would would be would collect the macadamia uh, nuts. They would dry, dry them in the sun, 
they would uh, sometimes roast them in the uh, ashes of their uh, their fires. They 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 had uh, a number of ways they would crack the macadamia, uh, crack the very hard shell. But uh, uh, one one of the very successful ways was they. Uh, uh, they would find a large rock that had a depression in it, and that would hold the macadamia. And they would they would put a flat rock over uh, uh, the macadamia and uh, use what I call a a hammer stone to hit the flat rock, and that that would distribute the force so that uh, it would crack the shell and uh, do very little damage to the kernel. But what about the name? What did Indigenous Australians call the macadamia? Well, the short answer to that question is, it depends on who exactly you're talking about. Indigenous Australians can't be classified into just one group. There was an incredible amount of diversity across Australia, many different nations, an estimated 200 to 300 different languages, as well as dialects within those languages in existence before European contact. Unfortunately, and this is a story that is not all that dissimilar from what happened in Hawaii as well as many other places around the world, with European colonization came the loss of culture and many of the languages I mentioned earlier. Because of this, it is not at all out of the question that we have lost some of the terms used to refer to macadamias before Europeans arrived. That being said, many have survived, and Ian explains that one of the most common ones is Gindel. That's G-Y-N-D-L. There were other names. There was uh, behind the uh, uh, Australia's Gold Coast area, they were known as Goombara. At the very northern limits, they were known as Bopple uh, Nuts. Uh, the uh, uh, a name that has been adopted by marketers here is Jindili. Uh, Jindili, or plural, was Yindili, but uh, that probably referred to uh, not only the macadamia but other plants. There was uh, Dullaby was a name. The the ver- first time macadamias were. Uh, were, were definitely collected by uh, uh, a botanist. It was in 1843, and he he wrote Dullaby. Another name was uh, was was Barham. So uh, uh, yes, we've uh, we, we we've got a, a sound record of uh, of different Aboriginal names from from the different people. Despite all the names that the macadamia has had throughout its history, ultimately it would just be one that would spread around the world, and that is, of course, the macadamia. Ian explains that the macadamia was named after a Dr. John McAdam, who lived from 1827 until 1865. Our John McAdam was a, a red-headed Scotchman. Uh, mm-hmm. He he was uh, a, a brilliant uh, man. He was a uh, uh, a member of parliament. He was a, a doctor of medicine. He was a forensic scientist. He was a postmaster uh, uh, general. Uh, he was the uh, secretary of the Philosophic Institute of Victoria, which was the the, uh, the body body of learning. Uh, he was also a, a lecturer at uh, a boys' high school, and he was looking for. Something, the words he used, he was looking for something to temper the spirits of teenage boys. If, uh-huh. uh, if Interesting. Could, yeah. So he, he, he was one of the inventors of Australian rules football. Oh. Uh, uh, <laughs> but but he, he, he died as largely through overwork. He was going to, uh, uh, he was 38 and he was sailing to New Zealand uh, to give evidence as a forensic scientist. He had a fall. And mm-hmm. uh, he never recovered from it. And he, uh, the macadamia was named uh, in his honour, uh, but he never saw a macadamia. He never t- tasted a macadamia. Mm-hmm. And I think it was a, a friend of his who who wanted to name it after him, right? He's the one that proposed it. Yes, Baron Ferdinand von Moller. Mm-hmm. Uh, d- there is some suggestion that uh, Ferdinand von Moller, who was a a very strong-willed uh, uh, man with a, a massive ego, there 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 is some some belief that he uh, looked for the most insignificant plant that he could find. 
to name uh, uh, to name it after John McAdam. So uh, wow. I'm not not sure whether that's correct because uh, uh, at at the time it was named, there was the belief that it was uh, uh, poisonous uh, uh-huh. and, and it had no significance at all. And it was ten, ten years after it was named before uh, the botanists and, and the majority of Australians uh, realised that it was actually edible. Hmm, okay, so the um, Australians of European ancestry, they, they didn't really catch on, so to speak. They thought it was, you know, maybe not good to eat. But of course, the Aboriginal people by that point, they, they knew full well that macadamia nuts were totally fine to eat. Yes, they, they, they knew that. And uh, they obviously told uh, settlers, uh, but, they, but they, they, there is no... Uh, written evidence uh, of that. The part of the problem is, and, and this occurred in Hawaii, that there are now four species of macadamia, but uh, uh, the, uh, uh, two of them are edible. But the, 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 the botanist got it wrong, and there is a, a small macadamia, uh, looks identical, uh, but is extremely bitter. And uh, the, the botanist called them both the same, and, and and the first nuts that went to Hawaii, or, or some of the first nuts that went to Hawaii, included the small bitter nut. So it, in in Hawaii, as the commercial industry developed, they they found that some of the uh, uh, macadamia kernels were very bitter. So uh, they uh, they they had to survey all of the trees and uh, and cut out the, the the trees that had the, this bitter component. And this mm. was this was it was un, only 1956 before the botanists clearly distinguished between the the the, the bitter macadamia, which mm. is, is not poisonous, but uh, the the Aboriginal people told the settlers not to eat it, and uh, so there was the assumption it was poisonous. It, it was just uh, extremely bitter. To learn more about the macadamia and conservation efforts being undertaken right now in Australia to preserve wild varieties, please see the links in the show notes. Um, last question: um, How do you? I I guess do you do you still eat macadamia nuts often? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I certainly do. I, I'm I'm a great. I I I I. I uh... Uh, use as a joke and say that uh, if you want to live forever, you eat more macadamia nuts. So, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, macadamia nuts contain a, a specific fa- fatty acid, uh, a monounsaturated fatty acid that's u- unique to macadamias, and it has been associated with longevity. The, the, ja- the Japanese have done a lot of study on that, and one of the interesting things is that uh, the Japanese have done a study of people who've lived to be a, a hundred. And in every case, uh, these people have, have had uh, elevated blood serum levels of this fatty acid, palmitolaic fatty acid. That, uh, so, uh, uh, yes, there's no, there's, there's no doubt that macadamia is a part of a, of a healthy diet. Transmissions from Hawaii is a production of Wasabi Magazine. It's produced in the beautiful city of Honolulu, Hawaii by me, Tony Vega. Thank you so much to everybody who helped make this episode possible. Aside from the help of the guests that you got to hear on the episode today, I also received help from various individuals, including Michael Naylor of the Queensland Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Foundation, Christine Stewart of Bulu Yabun, and the Macadamia Conservation Trust. I would like to acknowledge that the history of the macadamia intersects with the tragic history of Indigenous Australians. I very much wanted to include someone from that community in order to further highlight that aspect of the story. Unfortunately, despite my best efforts, I was unable to find anyone. For that, I apologize. If you would like to learn more about Indigenous Australians and the Gubby Gubby people who are the traditional custodians of Southeast Queensland, which is where Hawaii's macadamias have been shown to have originated, then please see the links in the show notes. We are hard at work on episode four. That should be coming in the not too distant future. But remember to subscribe so you don't miss it when it comes out. Also, don't forget to leave a rating and a review on your podcast app of choice. And please tell a friend or family member about the show. 
We need your help to grow the show and make it a sustainable thing. We want to keep producing episodes, but we need your help to do that. So please help spread the word. Mahalo for listening and see you next time on Transmissions from Hawaii.